I remember being chosen by my friends and neighbors for another position a long time ago. No right of refusal. And I ended up in a green uniform and spent a, uni uh, spent a year overseas in South Korea. <laughs> Not much fun at the time, but I do get a 10% discount at Lowe's. <laughs> so, Russell and I have had the benefit of many months of training and discipling from Pastor Tim, as well as the privilege of watching the elders on staff and the lay elders function. It is humbling to be asked to join this group of men on your behalf. My Connect class, we usually start with a story if I happen to be leading that week. I was asked if I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to tell a story. Adrian Rogers told this story uh, some time ago about a young girl who was asked what the difference between the paid elder staff and the unpaid staff was. She thought for a moment, and finally she said, well, the paid preachers are paid to be good, and the unpaid are just good for nothing. <laughs> so a part of the process is to build or is to preach a sermon, and although I've been on uh, your side of the pulpit many, many times, this is the first time on this side. And as we look into what the Holy Spirit might want to teach us today, let me give you some insight as just how I go about understanding the Scriptures. I just use a simple process taken from 2 Timothy 3, 16, quote, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So, as we go through this passage, let's just ask ourselves these questions. What am I learning? What am I being reproved of? What must I correct? Do I understand right and wrong better? Will I use what I know going forward? In other words, am I better equipped to follow and imitate Jesus Christ? As an elder in training, I've spent a lot of time examining what Scripture tells us about the role of the elder, and, and it led me to Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verses 1 to 16, and, and other references as well. And as I examined Scripture, and more specifically, hopefully allowed Scripture to examine me, I was taken to uh, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, and here's what it says. And he gave apostles, prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. And as I read this, it struck me that the verse says, quote, he gave. And that refers to the persons he gave to the church, not just the gifts or the roles. And I must admit, I never really thought of this in terms of particular persons instead of unique abilities. So it would follow that each and every person in the church body is a gift from the Holy Spirit, not just the abilities that we bring to bear. So let's uh, put some context around and background around this passage. Maybe it'll help us uh, to understand it. So my interest in biblical elders is what took me to this passage, but the primary uh, emphasis is not about elders. It's about church unity and the uniqueness in the church body. So let's start with an overview of the book of Ephesians. The author is the Apostle Paul. R.C. Sproul tells us that the Apostle Paul could be considered the greatest theologian who ever lived. The man would have an equivalent of two PhDs by the time he was 21 years old. That's pretty amazing. And it was by the means of this gift of his great intellect that he was able to reason out his belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? No, <laughs> of course not. Jesus Christ knocked him off his horse and blinded him with his radiance and awakened him to the truth. Even so, Paul was used and became a great gift not only to the early church, but to the church of all time. The secular psychologists call this a significant emotional event. We Christians call it being born again. 
S.A. Baugh tells us in his commentary that Ephesians was probably written around A.D. 60 to 62 toward the end of the Apostle Paul's first Roman imprisonment. It was as he was awaiting trial for the Emperor Nero, and the epistle is addressed to the saints in Ephesus, one of the leading cities on the coast of Asia Minor. John MacArthur tells us in his introduction to Ephesians, this letter is addressed to the church in the city of Ephesus, capital of the Roman province of Asia, Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey. Because the name Ephesus is not mentioned in every early manuscript, some scholars believe the letter was an encyclical intended to be circulated and read among all the churches in Asia Minor and was simply just sent first to the believers in Ephesus. He goes on to say, it is likely that the gospel was first brought to Ephesus by Priscilla and Aquila, an exceptionally gifted couple who were left there by Paul on his second missionary journey. Interesting note, the hearers of this letter did not have the benefit of copy machines or handouts or the overhead screens that uh, we have to focus, uh, to enhance our, enhance our focus as we do. Oxford Bibliographies tells us that most of the population of the early church were probably illiterate. Maybe 10% could read or write. So the early saints were probably very intense listeners, probably much better than we are. The spoken language in Ephesus was Greek, as was the written language the Apostle Paul used in all of his letters. Not much is known about the congregational size, but with the help of Vern Reader's research, the best speculation is the saints met in homes, some modified to accommodate worship, but no doubt the church at Ephesus was not nearly the size of Nixa, First Baptist. And I can imagine something less than 75 or so. So here are some important themes about uh, the book of Ephesians. The Gospel Coalition relates it this way. Two main themes. Number one, Christ has reconciled all creation to himself and to God. And two, Christ has united people from all nations to himself and to one another in his church. These great deeds were accomplished through his powerful, sovereign, and free-working by the powerful, sovereign, and free working of the triune God, which would be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and are recognized and received by faith alone through His grace. In light of these great truths, Christians are to lead lives that are a fitting tribute of the gratitude to their great Lord. So, as we begin uh, to discuss this, and I just want to give you some full dis- disclosure as we dig into this passage. I borrow heavily from John MacArthur's introduction and commentary, as well as S.M. Ball, and from the sermon notes of Pastor Phil Woods of Cornerstone Church at Lakewood Ranch, Florida. Per MacArthur, the first three chapters are theological, emphasizing New Testament doctrine, whereas the last three are practical and focus on Christian behavior. Perhaps above all, this is a letter of encouragement and admonition written to to remind believers of their immeasurable blessings in Jesus Christ. And not only to be thankful, but to live in a manner worthy of them. Despite, and partly maybe even because of a Christian's great blessings in Christ, he is surely to be tempted by Satan to self-satisfaction and complacency. It was for that reason, in the last chapter, Paul reminds us that the believers, uh, reminds the believers of the full and sufficient spiritual armor supplied to them through God's word and by his spirit, and of their need for vigilant and persistent prayer. A key theme of the letter is the mystery, meaning a truth not uh, known now, or not known until now, that the church, which is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Any Gentiles here today? This was a truth that was completely hidden from the Old Testament saints. All believers in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, are equal before the Lord as his children 
and as citizens of his eternal kingdom. That's a marvelous truth that only believers of this present age possess. Paul also speaks of the mystery of the church as the bride of Christ. So, why was the book of Ephesians written? According to Brian Chappell in his book uh, commentary, most Pauline letters are directed to the problems or progress of an individual church, requiring an initial exposition of truth that will later drive practical instructions. And he labels the chapter the owner's manual for the church. Pastor Woods divides the letter into two, two, two segments. Chapters 1 to 3 he labels as indicative and 4 to 6 is imperative. Simply stated, the indicative tells us who we already are in Christ and the imperative instructs us in how we should therefore live out that new reality. Michael Horton explains it this way, once we know who we are in Christ, the commands of Scripture begin to make sense. That leads to the second category, the imperative. If the indicative tells us who we already are in Christ, then the imperative instructs us how we should live out that new reality. The ESV Study Bible labels the passage, Unity in the Body of Christ. The thesis of this passage is the necessity for the unity of the church and the requirements of all believers to be engaged in fulfilling their responsibilities to that end. The Apostle Paul is teaching the first, uh, first century church at Ephesus about church unity. So this morning, I want to answer this question. How does this apply to the 21st century First Baptist Church of Nixa? So, although my desire led me to move more about elders, what led me to this passage, the primary theme is not about elders at all. It's about the unity of the church with an underlying message of how the gifts and ministries contribute to the unity and diversity of the local church. And just a rabbit trail for clarification here. The word and meaning of diversity has been so co-opted and so distorted to mean what we look like, skin color, gender, where we come from, ethnicity, tribe, gender, sexual preference, etc. And that is not what this passage is referencing. It is referencing the particular gifts and attributes we as individuals are given to produce the working functionality of this visible church. The church relies on the understanding that we are united around the person and work of Jesus Christ. Let's pick up uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, and it goes as follows. Therefore, a prisoner, I, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility, with gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope, that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father in all, who is over all and through all and in all. Notice the one is used seven times for emphasis, and all is used four times for contrast. The one tells us that we are called to look for what we all have in common. Again, referencing MacArthur, a major truth is emphasized is that of the church. It's Christ's present spiritual earthly body and is a distinct and formerly unknown truth about God's people. This metaphor depicts the church not as an organization, but as a living organism of mutually related and interdependent parts. Christ is the head of the body and the Holy Spirit is its lifeblood. The body functions through the faithful use of its members' various spiritual gifts sovereignly and uniquely bestowed by the Holy Spirit on each believer. We have one belief system that unites us around the person and work of Jesus Christ. We have one spirit that regenerated and applied the person and work of Christ to all of us. We have the same spirit that bears fruit in us humility, gentleness, Patience. We have a common hope, 
the same baptism, the same heavenly Father and God who adopted us into the eternal family. Another way to think about this or understand this is a Holy Spirit blood infusion or bone marrow transplant to give this church a healthy, sustaining life totally dependent on this infilling. As Simba explains it this way, Paul strongly urges the church to unity and love based on the truth of, of, of one God, his calling, and his one work of redemption. Believers are called to, quote, maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, purchased for us at such great cost by the one Lord Jesus Christ, bringing us to the one faith through one baptism into intimate fellowship with the one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Love thoroughly permeates the only kind of life that is worthy of the calling. And God has extended to us and draws us into his own kingdom and glory. Although the church is united as one in Christ, we are uniquely created and gifted according to the preordained objectives of God. So the church is one, but the church is also many. Verses 7 to 10 tell us, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. The church belongs to Christ, and each one of us is the recipient of Christ's grace to include the gift of ourselves. We serve as his body, and we also serve his body of saints. Verse 68 is a reference to, uh, well, let's just quote it. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious that the Lord God may dwell here. That's uh, Psalm 68, verse 18. Baum says, this is a clear portrayal of the Lord as a triumphant warrior who delivers his people from his and their enemies into salvation from death. The analogy and Old Testament reference here is this. The spoils of war belong to the victor, Jesus Christ, who graciously gave us not just abilities, but persons. MacArthur simplifies it as follows. When he ascended on high, Paul used a rendering as an analogy to show how Christ received the right to bestow gifts. Six, uh, Psalm 68 is a victory hymn composed by David to celebrate God's conquest of the Jebusite city of Jerusalem and the triumphant ascent of God up to Mount Zion. After such a triumph, the king would bring home the spoils and the prisoners. Here Paul uh, depicts Christ returning from his battle on earth back into the glory of the heavenly city with trophies of his great victory at Calvary, leading a host of captives. Through his crucifixion and resurrection, Christ conquered Satan and death and in triumph returned to God those who were once sinners and prisoners of Satan. He distributes the, poil, uh, the spoils throughout his kingdom. After his ascension came all the spiritual gifts empowered by the Holy Spirit who was then sent down to us. So, all of us have gifts and all of us are gifts from Christ without whom the, the church cannot be healthy unless all are actively involved in his mandates. And so here we are again at Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 13. The church is to be equipped and edified. Verse 11, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry to building up the body of Christ until we attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to measure, to the measure and stature and fullness of Christ. So what are these roles like? Let's take a look. Who were the apostles? Well, the initial group of apostles, number 12, 
the 11 original disciples who remained after Judas died, plus Matthias, who replaced Judas. Later, the group was expanded to include others, such as Paul, with the common qualifications being, number one, they had to have seen Christ with their own eyes after he had rose from the dead, and number two, they had to have been specifically appointed by Christ as an apostle. The ESV, ESV Study Bible Notes gives us a little more clarity. In a restricted sense, those who had been with Jesus and witnessed his resurrection or received special revelation of the risen Jesus and who had been commissioned by Jesus to be founders of the church. The word was also used in a broader sense of people sent out as delegates of a particular church as though these do not appear, appear to be the ones that Paul has in mind. So who are the prophets? Well, the New Testament prophets conveyed special revelation to the early church. Their functions included prediction, exhortation, encouragement, warning, explanation. The teaching of the New Testament prophet and apostles laid the foundation for the church. Remember, as Tim has taught us, though, these men did not have the same authority or calling as apostles, so their teaching was and is always to be held up against the Scriptures to ensure validation. <clears throat> the evangelists, they're defined as people who are specially gifted to proclaim the gospel. Think Billy Graham. But all individual believers are responsible to, quote, walk worthy as a witness to the truth of the gospel. So the shepherds and teachers are also known as elders, bishops, overseers, and pastors. The two words uh, go together to refer to a single set of individuals who both shepherd and instruct God's flock. They're authorized to teach, <clears throat> exercise oversight, settle disputes, pray for each other and the church and corporately and individually. The object of these offices is to lead and mold the flock. As verse 13 states, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Therefore, the responsibility of a healthy church and its leaders is to be on guard, to constantly working to ensure childlike faith doesn't become childish or naive. Verses 14 to 16, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, which when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Even a healthy church may be at risk of being led astray. <laughs> MacArthur's study Bible note on verse 14 explains it this way. Spiritually immature believers who are not grounded to the knowledge of Christ through God's word are inclined to uncritically accept every sort of beguiling doctrinal error and fallacious interpretation of Scripture promulgated by deceitful false teachers in the church. They must learn discernment. I'm reminded of 2 Timothy 3, or 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Quote, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears, and they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Verses 15 and 16 tell us how to achieve this and what's required of us. The church must speak the truth of Christ, empowered by the love of Christ, and be growing up in the image of Christ. The spiritually maturing believer who is equipped with sound doctrine is a confident and effective witness. Without maturity, MacArthur notes, the truth can be cold and love becomes little more than sentimentality. The church must also depend on Christ through the power and gifts of the Holy Spirit, first and foremost, as well as each other. For Brian Chapel again, 
Although each believer is differently gifted, we must all depend upon the Savior, seeking our strength in Him and seeking our purpose in Him. He goes on to say that Paul says that the whole body is joined together and held together by every supporting ligament as each part does its work and we have a deep obligation to one another. Everyone must do his or her part. Each has a calling to make the body work. So, Nixa, First Baptist Church. What are we to do with this instruction? And I think equally important, what are we not to do? Well, here's five takeaways, uh, takeaways for us to think about. Number one, focus on unifying attitudes, verses 1 to 3. Well, what's this look like? Well, we are to, quote, walk worthy of the calling. We have a responsibility to think before we speak, act in ways that promote humility and gentleness, and with an enthusiasm for the, quote, bond of peace. In contrast, disunifying attitudes show up in snarky remarks, looks, sarcastic responses, impulsive speech or actions, before you know the whole story, carrying tales, whether they're true or not, that have no benefit to the situation, and not allowing those you put in authority to fulfill their roles. Colossians 3.14 says it this way, quote, and above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Point two, verses four to seven. Each of us are charged by the grace given to us to always remember, quote, the measure of Christ's gift. Shouldn't grace given produce gratefulness in us? Shouldn't it show up in overlooking petty differences and forgiving others in advance? including your leaders who are under the same sanctification as we all are. We should be able to disagree on the minor, minor issues without being disagreeable. And we should always camp on the major doctrines of the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. The foundation of the love that binds us is the love of Christ. Remember, he loved us when we were unlovable. Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We must be willing to love the same way. Point three, carefully choose your leaders who are unifying in attitude and action. In our case, pastors and teachers to equip the saints. At times, this will look like edification, encouragement, exhortation. On the other hand, it may also be in this same bond of love, calling out behaviors and attitudes that do not, quote, attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. These situations are awkward, but they're necessary, and they fall under the authority of these roles. Authority is defined as the right to impose obligation. Verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into every way into him who is the head, Jesus Christ. Point four, all of us have the common responsibility of fulfilling this call to unity. With Christ as our head and example, we will be, quote, joined and held together when each part is working properly so that it builds itself up in love. Five, here's a reminder for us about the church at Ephesus. In Revelations chapter 2, Jesus sends an admonition to the Ephesian church. This was barely one generation removed from Paul's letter and the considerable time and effort of Paul and Timothy and others to lead and pastor this church. So what happened? Well, although apparently they were going through the motions of work, testing their leaders, endurance, watchfulness, Verse 4 states this, but I have this against you, that you've abandoned the love you had at first. So our motivation is not towards gifts and ministries, but the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So here's a final thought on gifts and ministries. Most everyone here probably knows the words of the doxology since we just sang it a while ago. <laughs> first penned in uh, 1674 by Thomas Ken. 
This song, uh, this makes the song about 350 years old, and it goes as follows. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. With some license, here's another possible verse to the great poem to assist our memory. Praise God from whom all giftings come. Praise him, believers. All receive some. Love him by using each and every one. To the glory of the Father, the Spirit, and the Son.